Hi, I'm Kenton, and I'm going to um, tell you today about how to, or how we built a um, platform, a cloud platform, cloud compute platform designed for massive multi-tenancy without using virtual machines or containers, but instead using uh, V8 isolates. So let me start by explaining what it is we are trying to solve here. So Cloudflare operates a uh, network of servers located in 165 locations worldwide and growing all the time. Um, and historically, what these servers could do, if you put them in front of your website, they'd act as a glorified HTTP proxy. Uh, they could give you HTTP caching. They could give you um, detecting and blocking security threats. Famously, they give you DDoS mitigation. Um, but a few years ago, um, Cloudflare thought, well, it would be really cool if people could just run code on these machines. Uh, give us a, a piece of code to distribute and have it run in all those places and handle HTTP requests for your site directly there. And this could be either to, um, uh, to, to augment the functionality of Cloudflare itself to implement new features that we hadn't implemented yet, or it could be to actually take entire applications and um, run them across the whole network such that you're not really thinking about where it runs anymore. It just runs everywhere. Like, kind of like what I feel like the cloud was supposed to be all along, rather than choosing one or two locations. Um, but there's a challenge in this. There's a, there's a scalability challenge. And it's not the scalability challenge that we normally think about. Normally, we think about scaling to traffic, the number of requests that we can handle per second. And, Scaling to traffic is actually really easy for Cloudflare because every time we add a new location, it means we can handle more traffic, add more service to that location, can handle more traffic. Um, and it's you know, evenly distributed across the whole network. Our, our architecture scales out very nicely. Um, but the kind of scalability I'm talking about here is scalability to the number of tenants, the number of applications that we can be hosting at one time. And the challenge with this is that, again, we don't want people to choose uh, one or two or five locations where their software runs. We want it to run everywhere. We want everyone's code running in every one of our locations. And some of our locations are not that big. Uh, some have uh, lots and lots of computers, but others have uh, maybe a dozen machines. And so how do you fit, uh, you know, we have 10 million customers on a dozen machines. Turns out that the, um, the existing technologies for this, the existing server-side technologies, don't live up to the task. What we really need is uh, basically 100x efficiency gain in the um, number of people we can host and 100x decrease in how, much, uh, how many resources each one is uh, using. Quick intro on me. Um, worked for Google for a long time where I was best known for um, open sourcing protocol buffers. I created version two, which was the open source version. Um, after I left Google, I created Captain Proto, as he mentioned, which is an alternative um, serialization and RPC framework. And then I founded a company called Sandstorm that was doing interesting things with um, decentralized uh, web hosting uh, or hosting of web applications and um, security around that. Um, the uh, Company made some cool tech, but um, uh, I kind of failed on the, the business side uh, in a classic fashion. And a couple of years ago, I was looking for something new. Um, and talked to Cloudflare, and they said, hey, well, we have this idea. We want people to run code on our edge. We're not sure how we want to do it. Do you want to take this on? And I said, yeah. A um, couple of warnings. This is actually the first time I've spoken at a conference. I'm not an experienced speaker. Um, and I am also not a graphics designer. My slides, uh, as the talk goes on, are going to get worse and worse, and <laughs> you're going to want to avert your vision at the end. Um, so getting back to efficiency, what kind of efficiency do we need here? Well, first of all, we need apps to be very small. Um, we can't be shipping around even 100 megabyte app images because we can't fit enough of those on one machine to host the number of apps that we want. We want apps that are more like a megabyte or less in code size. We want the baseline memory usage, that, that is the, 
the amount of memory the app uses when it has just started up and it's not doing anything particular in particular has to be very low so that we can fit many of them. Um, context switching, this is interesting. So in our environment, because we have requests uh, distributed across the whole world, um, although we need to host a lot of tenants in each location, each one of them is not going to be getting very much traffic because they're only going to be getting the traffic that originates in that local part of the world. So what that ends up meaning is that we are actually diffusing our traffic across all of the tenants on the machine, potentially every request, uh, handling tens of thousands of requests per second, um, with a new, uh, new tenant each time handling that request. That means that context switching overhead becomes a problem for us like it isn't for um, basically anyone else. You know, a big VM cloud provider will usually pin your VM to a core and it just runs on that core and it doesn't switch at all. Um, we're at the other end of the spectrum to the point where even switching processes uh, can be too much of a problem because of all the caches that get flushed in the CPU. So we need to potentially put lots of tenants in a single process. Um, and then finally, startup time. If we can get startup time to be really, really fast, then we don't have to worry as much about memory usage because we can just kick out the, the, um, the tenants who aren't currently handling traffic and start them back up again when they're needed. So ideally, we'd like something that's just a couple of milliseconds, so it's not even perceptible that, um, that we've initiated a cold start when the request comes in. Now, we're not the only ones who need this stuff. Just to give you an idea of some other um, use cases. So if you have an API that you're exposing to the world over the web, especially like a server-to-server -server kind of thing, uh, your, the clients of that API might not like the latency incurred by going over the internet to talk to it. They might want to host their code directly on your servers in some way. If you wanted to give them the ability to do that, you probably aren't going to give each of them uh, a virtual machine or even anything heavyweight. You would like something very cheap. If you're doing big data processing, say you have a gigantic data set and you have multiple untrusted third parties that want to do map reduces over this. Um, in big data processing, you cannot bring the data to the software. You have to bring the software to the data. So you need a very efficient way of um, taking some code from someone and spreading it across all of your machines where the data actually lives. And another uh, use case is something like web browsers where you, uh, uh, people are browsing the internet, they download code from every site that they go to so that um, the site can be more interactive running locally. But you know, don't we already have that? Uh, we've actually had that for quite some time, about 20 years now. So that's interesting because we're, we've been looking at the server technology and it's too inefficient to work for this use case, but could it be that web browsers have already developed the technology that we need um, to solve our problem. And it turns out that uh, indeed they have. Web browsers are optimized to start up uh, code really, really fast because the user is sitting there waiting for it to start. Um, they're optimized to allow for application code to be relatively small so that it can download quickly. Um, they're optimized to have lots of uh, separate, uh, separate sandboxes at the same time, not just for separate tabs, but each iframe within a tab potentially needs, is potentially a different website and, and needs a sandbox. It may be an ad network. It may be the Facebook like button. Those are all iframes. You don't see it, but they're all whole separate JavaScript contexts. And of course, web browsers have been, uh, probably the most hostile security environment that exists for quite some time. Um, if you can hack somebody's web browser, you can do a lot of damage. All you have to do is convince someone to click on a bad link and potentially um, you can mm, uh, get into all their other websites and so on. So this led us to the conclusion that what we want is the technology from web browsers and in in particular, we chose V8, which is the JavaScript uh, execution engine from Google Chrome. 
It seems to have the most resources behind it, basically, which is why we chose it, though some of the others might work well, too. Um, and we found that this works great as a, an engine for extreme multi-tenancy. So we'll go into the details a little bit. Um, we've been using this word isolate instead of VMs or containers. We now have isolates. What is an isolate? It actually comes from part of the V8 embedders API. When you build um, around V8, uh, you're going to be using the C++ interface. V8 is a library. It has a class called isolate, and what an isolate represents is one uh, JavaScript execution environment. It's what we used to call virtual machines, um, like JVM, Java Virtual Machine. Now the word virtual machine has these two meanings, and most people mean something entirely different. So, so we use the word isolate instead. Um, now here's why, or one reason why, isolates turn out to be so much more efficient. So, uh, you know, in, in virtual machines, the, the application brings its own kernel and its own operating system, traditionally. And so that's, you, you get huge images. With containers, they got so much more efficient because now the operating system kernel is shared between all of the tenants. And the applications only need to bring their own code and any um, libraries and maybe language environments that they build on top of. So they got a lot smaller and um, uh, less, less resource intensive. With isolates, we can go further. So now we have a whole, um, uh, all, all these user space things, traditionally user space things that we can share between all of the tenants of our system. We have uh, the JavaScript runtime, which includes uh, a garbage collector and a JIT compiler. So very complicated pieces of code. If we can have only one copy of that code instead of several, that helps a lot. Um, and we can provide high-level APIs. Um, instead of providing, you know, in containers, you, your API is the system call API. That's pretty low level. If we can do something much higher level, we can do things like um, have the same HTTP implementation shared between all of the, the tenants. And hopefully, they then only need to bring their own business logic and not a big pile of dependencies. Um, but we don't want to just go start inventing a bunch of our own new APIs for this. It turns out there are standards. Um, so the, the browser, as, as we know, has um, APIs for things like HTTP requests, um, traditionally XML HTTP requests, but these days it's better to use the fetch API. What you might not know is that the browser also has standardized APIs for acting as an HTTP server in the what's called the, the service workers standard, which is a, it lets you run scripts on the browser side that intercept HTTP requests. This turns out to be exactly what we want for our use case, so we didn't have to develop any new APIs of our own. And this is great because it means that this code um, that runs on Cloudflare workers is potentially portable to other environments, especially if some of the other serverless providers decide to also support standard APIs at some point. Um, and this is an example here of a complete um, HTTP proxy server written in about 10 lines of code. And it actually does something useful. This, this server is checking for um, incoming requests whose URLs end with .jpg and it is sending those requests to a different backend than everything else. Something you, know, you might see all the time. Um, but what's interesting is there are no, no imports, no require statements here. This is just using the built-in APIs in the platform and 10 lines of code and we get something, something useful. That's how we make code footprint so much smaller. Um, a lot of people lately have been talking about uh, WebAssembly. So with V8, we get WebAssembly for free. Um, it's, it's part of V8. And so we've actually enabled this in workers. And so that means potentially with WebAssembly, the promise is now you can write in any language, not just JavaScript. There's just a little problem with this currently, which is that 
now you're back to shipping your own language runtime because potentially every tenant has their own language that they want to use. So you see people, they want to use Go, and so now they're shipping the Go garbage collector and the Go green threads implementation and all of the standard libraries for Go, and it's very large and it goes over the, the various limits. Um, this is not solved yet, but it will be. Um, what we essentially need here is a way for, uh, uh, a way to do dynamic linking um, on WebAssembly modules so that the, the Go 1.11 runtime can be something that we share across multiple isolates. Um, and, and then each one brings its own application code on top of that. The good news is we're gonna be working on that. Um, if you go to Ashley Williams' talk tomorrow, uh, she'll tell you all about what we're going to be um, building on this to fix this. So you can s start to see why this is part of the operating systems track. Um, it's looking a bit like an operating system. And it's about to look even more like an operating system. So another thing that we have to do, like, how do we... Um, figure out when to start up apps, make sure they don't use too many resources, and so on. So, in a traditional operating system, um, you have a bunch of processes, they're using memory, and they kind of allocate the amount of memory that they want, and the operating system has to live with that and hope that um, everything fits in memory. Because if it doesn't, then it has to take drastic measures. In Linux, there's something called the oom um killer, out of memory killer, that kicks in when you run out of memory and it tries to choose the least important process and kill it. Um, doesn't always choose correctly and it's a problem because these processes have state. In our environment, um, these isolates are essentially stateless. When they're not actively handling a request, they don't have any other state that's important. We can um, kick them out at any time. So we end up with a completely different memory management strategy, which is we say, okay, um, we want to, we can set by configuration that we're going to use eight gigabytes of memory. And we'll fill that up until it's full and then we'll evict the least recently used isolate to make sure that we stay under that eight gigabytes. And, it, and it's, it's pretty neat to know exactly how much memory your server needs to use, um, makes a lot of things easier. And now we have this trade-off basically between um, memory and CPU because if we have um, too many uh, customers cycling through too often, then um, we'll, we'll be restarting isolates that we recently evicted too often. But it's a, it's a sliding scale and we can monitor it over time. There's not gonna be an emergency where all of a sudden we're out of space. Um, and, yeah, and then we can, we can bump up the memory um, when we see that there's too much churn happening. We need to make sure that an isolate can't consume all of the resources on a system. And there's um, a couple of ways that we do that. So for CPU time, we actually limit each isolate to uh, 50 milliseconds of CPU execution per request. And the way we do that is through the, the Linux timer create system call lets you set up to uh, receive a signal when a certain amount of CPU time has gone by. And then from that signal handler, we can call a V8 function called terminate execution, which will actually cancel execution wherever it is. If you have just a like while true open brace, close brace, infinite loop, it can still cancel that. It essentially throws an uncatchable exception um, and then we regain control and we can error out that request. Um, note that we run, so an isolate in JavaScript is a single threaded thing. JavaScript is inherently a single threaded event driven language. So um, an isolate is only running on one thread at a time. Other isolates can be on other threads. We also, uh, we don't technically have to, but in our, um, uh, our design, we never run more than one isolate on a thread at a time. Like we could, we could have multiple isolates assigned to one thread and handle the events as they come in, but what we don't want is for one isolate to be able to block another with a long computation and create 
latency for someone else, so we put them each on different threads. Um, memory is interesting. V8 has a way for you to say, I don't want this isolate to use more than this amount of memory, please stop it at that point. The problem is, when you hit that limit, it aborts the process. And that means we've aborted all the other isolates on the machine as well. So that's not what we want. So instead, we end up having to do more of a monitoring approach. Um, after each time we call into JavaScript, when it returns, we check um, uh, how much heap space it is now using. If it's gone a little bit over its limit, then we'll do a soft eviction where it can continue handling in-flight requests, but for any new requests, we can just start up another isolate. And if it goes way over, then we'll just kill it and cancel all the requests. And this works in conjunction with the, the CPU time limit because um, generally you can't, uh, you can't allocate a whole lot of, uh, of data um, without spending some CPU time on that, at least not JavaScript objects. And then typed arrays are something different, but it's a long story. Um, so, Another problem is we need to get our code, or the, the user's code, to all the machines that, uh, that run that code. And it sure would be sad if we had uh, achieved our five millisecond startup time only to spend 200 milliseconds waiting for some storage server to return the code to us before we could even execute it. So what we're doing right now is actually we distribute the code to all of the machines in our fleet up front. We already had um, technology for this to distribute configuration changes to the edge, and we just said code is another kind of configuration, and threw it in there, and it works, and it means that um, you're, it takes about th three seconds between when you upload your code and when it's on every machine in our fleet. Um, and because the, the code footprint of each of these is so small, this is basically fine so far. Um, we have enough disk space. Now, it may come to the point where we don't at some point, and then we'll have to make the trade-off of like uh, deciding who gets slower startups because we need to um, store their code in a more central location. But it could probably be a per colo thing instead of a every single machine thing, and so shouldn't add too much latency. So let me get to the thing that everyone wants to ask me about, which is security. Um, there's a question as to whether V8 is secure enough for servers. And you'll see, actually, some um, uh, security experts saying that it isn't. Surprisingly enough, some people at Google saying that it isn't. And what do they, what do they mean by this? Um, and, oh, Actually, so, well, okay, so here's basically the problem. And I said my slides were gonna get ugly. Uh, they've gotten ugly. This is ugly not just visually, but also for the content. Um, V8 has these bugs. In this particular case, this is two lines of code from deep in the V8 uh, optimizer, where it is uh, these, these two lines basically say that the function math.expm1, which calculates um, e to the power of x minus 1, I'm not good at math, so I don't know why you want that, but I'm sure there's a reason. Um, it, uh, the, this line says to the optimizer that it returns either a plain number or nan, not a number. Turns out, though, that it can also return negative 0. And for some reason, negative zero is not a plain number in V8's type system. As a result, people were able to exploit this, this one little error to uh, completely break out of the V8 sandbox by basically tricking the system into uh, thinking something was a different type or, or, or triggering an optimization that shouldn't have happened. Um, and the details are complicated and really interesting. If you want to know more, um, check out this, this blog post. Um, it's very understandable. You don't need to know V8 details, but this guy, Andrea Biondo, um, wrote it all up. It's very interesting. 
So that sounds pretty bad. Like you can imagine that there's going to be lots of bugs like this in V8. It's a big, complicated system. And the, the assertion is that um, because of this, V8 is not trustworthy enough, whereas, say, virtual machines and, and maybe containers are more trustworthy because they have a smaller attack service. Well, here's the thing. Nothing is secure. Um, security is not an on or off thing. Everything has bugs. Uh, virtual machines have bugs. Kernels have bugs. Hardware has bugs. And we really need to be thinking about risk management, ways that we can um, uh, account for the fact that there are going to be bugs and uh, make sure that they have minimum impact. And, you know, the bugs in V8, the, the, the frequency of bug reports in V8, there's kind of two ways to look at it that could make it bad or good. So. Um, V8 has relatively more bugs reported against it than um, virtual machines. So that, that's bad because it's showing that there's a larger attack surface, there's more things to, to attack. But there's also um, a good side to this, which is that it means that there's a lot of uh, research being done. And actually, the vast majority of V8 bug reports that, that like, I have access to before the rest of the world, I look at them, and almost every single one of them um, is found by V8's own fuzzing infrastructure. It's found by uh, Google, essentially. They've put an amazing amount of effort into this. And uh, I just learned, actually, recently that not only does V8 have a bug bounty, where if you find a sandbox <laughs> breakout, Google will pay you $15,000, maybe more, um, which makes it like, uh, so if you're going to use it to exploit someone, you, you need to uh, be getting more than that out of it, right? But they also have a bounty for, for fuzzers. If you write a new fuzzer um, and add it to their, their infrastructure, like a new test case, basically, and it finds bugs, they will pay you for those bugs. That was, that was really interesting to me. So then, and people do this. Um, every now and then, someone will submit a, a new fuzzer, and it will find a bunch of new things, and they'll get paid out. And that's just like awesome um, how much has gone into this. On the other hand, like if you're looking at a, a security solution and it has no bugs ever reported against it, you don't want to use that. Because what that means is no one has looked. No one writes bug-free code. So this is why I'm I, I, feeling fairly comfortable about this. Um, and now let's talk about risk management. How can we um, limit the, the damage caused when a bug happens? So there's things that you may do in your browser today to protect yourself against browser bugs. And some of them apply to the server as well. Obvious one, you probably install Chrome updates as soon as they become available. Well, um, we can do something on the server that's even better. We can um, see the, the, when the commit lands in the V8 repository, which happens before the Chrome update, and automate our build system so that um, we can get that out into production within hours automatically, we don't even need someone to click, right? Um, something that probably fewer of you do on the browser, but I'm sure a few of you, uh, is use separate browser profiles for visiting suspicious sites versus visiting your important sites. This is actually really easy to do in Chrome. There's great user management also in, in other browsers as well, or some people prefer to just use separate browsers. But we can do something similar to this on the server, which is we can, like, we don't have the ability to spin up a process for every single tenant, but we can spin up a process, um, like, one for enterprise users, one for established users who have been paying for a while, and one for um, free users uh, when they come. We don't currently have a free plan, but if we were to in the future. Um, 
and then we can put additional isolation around those. We can put those in a container or in a VM or whatever else we want. And yeah, so that makes it pretty hard for an attacker to just like sign up and get something good. There's some things, some risk management things we can do on the server that we cannot do so easily on the browser. One of them is we store every single piece of code that executes on our platform. Because we do not allow you to call eval to evaluate code at runtime. You have to upload your code to us and then we distribute it. And what that means is that if anyone tries to upload an attack, we now have a record of that attack. If it's a zero day that they have attacked, um, they have now burned their zero day when we uh, take a look at that code. And you know we'll submit it to, to Google and then the, the uh, person who uploaded it won't get their $15,000. Um, and we can, we can do a lot of monitoring, for example, um, we can watch for seg faults um, anywhere uh, on any of our servers. Like they, they are rare and when they happen, we raise an alert, we look at it, and we see in the crash report it says what script was running. So we're gonna immediately look at that script which we have available. Um, now, Chrome can't really do this because it, it can't just upload any script it sees because it's potentially a privacy violation. Um, and they can't investigate every crash report they get because they're, they're, um, the browser is running on so many different pieces of hardware, some of which are just terrible. They get a constant stream of these crash reports. It, it could be terrible hardware, it could be that the user has installed malicious software already and it's trying to modify Chrome, that happens a lot and that causes a bunch of crash reports and all these other things. So they have a much harder time actually like looking for um, the attacks. So, what about Spectre? Speculative uh, execution side channels. So a couple of weeks ago, the, uh, the V8 team at Google put out this paper that basically said that they cannot solve Spectre and so therefore Chrome is moving towards um, isolating every, every site in its own process um, instead of doing anything internally. And in particular they said like timers, timer mitigations are useless. And so when this came out we uh, started getting a lot of people asking us, D doesn't that apply to Cloudflare? Um, is, is, uh, are you totally vulnerable to Spectre? Well, here's the thing. You have to be careful when you read this paper to understand what it is actually saying. It is saying that the V8 team has not been able to find anything else they can do except for rely on process isolation. It is not saying that process isolation solves the problem. And the problem is, if you, you go to the, the Intel side, um, there have been a bunch of different variants of Spectre found already, and each time it requires sort of a custom fix, and miraculously so far they've always been able to somehow fix it through some crazy thing they do in, uh, in microcode or whatnot. Usually there's a gigantic performance penalty. Um, Sometimes people say the performance penalty isn't worth it, but uh, they're not done. Like, there's going to be more bugs. They're just not found yet, and we don't know for sure if all of these bugs will have mitigations that are easy, and mitigations that are easier than buying new hardware. It, it's it's kind of scary. When you talk to the people who have been researching a lot of this stuff, they're like, I, I don't know. Like, we could see a bug that breaks out of virtual machines and not have anything to do, or anything we can do about it. But in Cloudflare's case, we actually have some things we can do that basically nobody else can do. Um, so we're taking a different, an entirely different approach here. Um, in our API, we have actually removed all timers from our API. We can do that because we don't have any backwards compatibility legacy that we need to support, and because um, our, 
our API is at a much higher level to the point where applications don't usually need to, to time things. Like if you're implementing, say, a new uh, pthreads library, you need access to a high precision timer to, to do it well, or if a new garbage collector, you need a high precision timer for that. But we provide those in this, this platform. The application only does business logic -y stuff. Um, we actually, uh, the, the application can still ask what time it is. It can call date.now. But the value that's returned by that does not advance during execution. So it essentially tells you when the last network message was received. So if you check it and then run a specter attack in a loop and then check it again, it returns the same value and the difference is zero. So you think that you just ran at infinite speed. Um, we also don't provide any concurrency primitives because any kind of um, a concurrency can usually be used to build a timer by comparing your own execution against whatever happens in the other thread. And that's another thing that like browsers can't do that. They have this platform they need to support um, that already has explicit concurrency in it and also has implicit concurrency in like rendering. You know, you start some rendering and then you do something and then you check how much the rendering has progressed. Um, in our platform, we can eliminate all of those. Now, it is, of course, still possible to do remote timing. The client can send a request to their, to their worker and see how long it takes to reply. That's over the internet. Um, there's noise in that, but noise doesn't mean it's impossible to attack. Um, no amount of noise will prevent a specter attack. The specter attack just has to amplify itself until the point where um, the difference between a one bit and a zero bit is larger than the, the noise window. Um, but the noise does lower the bandwidth um, of the attack. And it can lower it far enough that now we have an opportunity to come in there and notice that something fishy is going on. We can look for things like um, high cache misses or other telltale signs that someone is doing something fishy. And then we, can, we, we have this other superpower, which is that because the isolates are stateless, we can just move them at that point to another process or to another machine. Let them keep running. So if we have a false positive, that's fine. The, the worker will continue to do its job. Um, but now we're, we've taken the attackers and moved them away, um, and everyone else is potentially uh, safe. So, but this is, as I said, um, it hasn't been tried before. Um, so there's a lot of research to do, and we're going to be working with um, some of the, the foremost researchers in, in the in speculative side channels to uh, check our work here. Um, there will be announcements about that soon once we have the details worked out. But I'm backing up a bit. Like, we could just say, oh, there's challenges here. It doesn't work. Um, let's, let's not do this. But we can't because there's too much value here. Like the history of computing, uh, of server-side computing in particular, has been of getting to finer and finer granularity. Like when virtual machines started being used, um, they weren't thought of as secure. Um, but virtual machines have now enabled public cloud, which is clearly uh, incredibly valuable. Containers have had their naysayers. But um, they enable microservices, which are incredibly valuable, as we saw in the keynote this morning. Um, we have to, we can't just like say it doesn't work. We have to solve the problems. With isolate computing, we have the potential to handle every single event in the, the best place for that one event to be handled, whether that's close to a user or that's close to the data that it's operating on. Um, and that's, that's going to change everything about how we, we develop servers. Like, you're not going to think about um, where your code runs anymore. It's a lot less to think about, but then everything is going to be faster, too. Imagine this. Like, imagine you have an app that uses some, some third-party API that's also built on this infrastructure and another API, and it's built on other APIs. So you've got this whole stack of infrastructure. Imagine that can all actually run on the same machine. 
um, because uh, all in the same machine, which itself is located in the cell tower that's closest to the user. That would be amazing. Um, that's what we're going for here. So, yeah. All right, that's my talk. Um, answer questions. Mm -hmm. Great talk, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about utilization, I mean CPU utilization. Uh, if we talk about uh, scenarios like proxies, then probably isolates do not do anything most of the time, just waiting for response from remote system. So do you run thousands of these threads uh, with isolates in parallel, or you have a uh, thread per core and so CPU is almost free? And the second question is, related. Do you have any uh, SLA bar related to uh, latency, like minimal or maximal latency before your script <coughs> will up and running? Um, so, yeah, we, we can potentially have, so as I said earlier, we start up a, a thread, or we, we have different isolates running on different threads. We actually start a thread for each um, incoming HTTP connection, which are connections incoming from an Nginx server on the same machine. Um, this is kind of a neat trick because um, Nginx will only send one HTTP request on that connection at a time. So this is how we know that we only have one isolate executing at a time. Um, but we can potentially have as many threads as are needed to handle the concurrent requests. Um, the, the, the workers will usually be spending most of their time waiting for some back end, so not actually executing that whole time. Um, does that sort of answer your first question? Or is there more to it? Yeah, almost. Yeah, but in this case, uh, uh, you can go, I don't know, 10 uh, requests which consumes all the CPU, and then other requests will be just waiting and you'll have high latency. I mean, right, how, right, right. how you, how you so, deal with uh, CPU sharing between a uh, thousand of requests? Right, right, right. Um, so first of all, you're limited to 50 milliseconds per request and we cancel them after that. But um, the, it's still possible for if there's enough isolates and enough requests, you could run out of total CPU. And basically that's a provisioning problem. We need to make sure that um, we have plenty of CPU capacity in all of our locations. And when we don't, when one location gets a little overloaded, what we do is we actually shift um, usually the, the free users, we just shift them to other locations. The free users of our general service, uh, there isn't a free tier of workers yet, but, um, but that offloads CPU to other places without affecting any of the paying users in any way. Um, and so we've been doing that for a long time. Um, it works pretty well. And then the second part of your question? It was about latency, it's related. So. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, SLAs, I, I don't think we have a specific SLA for latency. Well, actually, I don't know. That might be something that is someone else's department. <laughs> the guy doesn't have one. <laughs> but it, it's usually pretty good. <laughs> So you mentioned in the beginning that customers can use this to augment Cloudflare functionality. Um, you also mentioned that you store and inspect users' code. What kind of protections do you have to kind of allay customers' fears that you will just steal their code, essentially? <laughs> huh. um, so we look at code only for uh, debugging and incident response purposes. We don't like dig through code to see what people are doing um, for fun. Um, and I mean, so we, we don't want, like that's not what we wanna do. We have um, something called the Cloudflare App Store which actually lets you publish a, a worker for other people to install on their own sites. Um, it's a, the, being able to do it with workers is, is in beta right now. Um, so this will be something that will ramp up uh, soon. 
but um, then you can actually you sell that to other users. And we'd much rather have people selling their, their neat features that they've built on Cloudflare to each other in this marketplace than have us just like build it ourselves. Um, there's so much more we can do that way. Um, we'd rather focus on the core network platform and, and on building more servers than like trying to come up with everything other than the sun that people can build on it. Is um, all these tools that you're creating, are they going to remain proprietary Cloudflare things for your platform? Or are you going to actually start to maybe open source some of these tools for other people to use them to do similar things or to yeah, benefit from? So we don't have specific plans yet, but I can tell you personally, I would very much like to um, start open sourcing parts of this probably in stages like we have this great glue layer that we use for um, binding um, APIs written in native code into JavaScript so they can be called um, and I, it, I would like to do that can't make any announcements right now Is there any ability or thought about being able to store some sort of state on, on the edge, right? Because you're basically just processing data as it passes through. Is there a future where you can do some sort of fancier processing right there? So storing state on the edge. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot of, uh, we have a number of projects that, uh, that we're working on with the goal of eventually Every user's data, if you build an application on Cloudflare storage, then every user's data, every user of your application, their data should be stored at the closest location to them. Um, and I like to, I have this thought experiment um, I like to think about, which is when people go to Mars, uh, is the internet still going to work? Can you use web apps from Mars? Well, in today's model, no, because you're going to wait for a half an hour round trip to do every page load. But if we send a Cloudflare pop to Mars um, and an application were written on Cloudflare storage, would people then be able to use it as long as they're only collaborating with other people on Mars? And if we solve that problem, then we've also solved the problem of like uh, uh, slow internet in New Zealand. So it's important here too. Um, but uh, there, there's a number of efforts underway. One of the first ones that's already in beta is called Workers KV. Um, it, it's fairly simple right now. It's a KV store, but it's optimized for read-heavy workloads, not really for lots of writes from the edge. Um, but we're, there, there's things we're working on that I'm very excited about, but not ready to talk about yet, that will allow whole databases to be built on the edge. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, question. Uh, considering the fact uh, that there are no free services uh, at the moment, uh, what are the ways to get in touch with the technology and uh, to experiment a little bit with it? Yeah, great question. So if you go to cloudflareworkers.com, you can actually play around with it just in your web browser. Like you write some code and it immediately runs and it shows you um, what the result would be. Um, that's free. Um, and then when you want to actually deploy it on your site, um, the, the cost is uh, $5 <coughs> per month uh, minimum, and then it, it's uh, 50 cents per million requests. So you get the first 10 million free. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's less expensive for a lot of people than like Lambda. All right. Uh, so, and like like you said, my like one of the awesome things about Cloudflare is its DDoS protection uh, and handling some of the most hardcore traffic patterns on the internet. Mm -hmm. And now that we're running JavaScript at the edge in this controlled computing environment, uh, does your DDoS strategy change at all uh, when you get tons and tons and tons of load? <laughs> yeah. So the DDoS protection happens before um, workers. So, so your worker is protected. Um, so, that, so that's one part. There is, of course, an interesting new question here is, could you use workers to launch a DDoS on someone else? Like, oh, now you've got 165 well-connected locations that can run your code and send lots of requests to someone. And 
Yeah, we, we, we don't let you do that. <laughs> when people try, they get shut down really quick. That's all I'll say about that, because I have to stop. <laughs>